Hello, I am Natalie Cook from Syracuse University, and today I will be talking about environmental geopolitics in Central Asia. Uh, I am a geographer, so I come to this topic with a particular uh, geographer's hat, but I'm also a political geographer. Uh, many people don't necessarily understand the difference between uh, human geography and physical geography, uh, but the human geographers like us who do political geography are interested in uh, the politics politics of nature society relations uh, as as you'll see from from the lecture today so the lecture will be split into three different parts, uh, and the, the two case studies that I'll talk about will come and connect to my own experiences in, in uh, Kazakhstan, and in uh, the, the broader sort of framing, we'll get a little bit of a chance to see other parts of Central Asia, but I will focus for, for most of the lecture on, uh, on Kazakhstan. So just to get us introduced to the topic of environmental geopolitics, it's probably not something that's very familiar to most people. Uh, people might know the term environment and they might know the word geopolitics, but to put them together uh, might be a little bit confusing. So I'll just get us, get us started with uh, an introduction to what that topic is. So basically what we're looking at uh, is that intersection between environmental issues and natural resources, natural natural resource extraction, for example, with geopolitics. Uh, so to understand how this intersection actually plays out, we then also need to kind of backtrack for those who might not come to uh, this topic with a geography background and introduce some of the key terms that are really important for geographers in understanding uh, this topic. So nature, resources, and security. Uh, these are three really important themes that run through the discussions of environmental geopolitics, uh, but we have to understand them as socially constructed. Socially constructed essentially just means that they are not natural givens, like there isn't a, a pure essence to what nature is and we just need to delineate uh, what, what that means and then we're good to go. We're never good to go. Uh, we have to always understand how these things are constructed. So let's start with nature. Um, the question that, that I think helps get us started with this uh, social construction approach to nature is how you actually delineate what the difference is uh, between what is natural and what's not. It often feels very easy for some of us to think, okay, there's a forest over there and here's a city and the forest is a natural environment and the, the city is not. But in a city, you have trees. Right? And where did those trees come from? Who planted those trees? How are they managed? Those questions you can also ask about the forest, right? So the forest is often planted, managed, and human controlled in very specific ways. So the, the bigger point uh, that geographers bring to this uh, idea of nature is that that division between humans and nature is it's a fiction, basically, uh, that we create that. And so when we're interested in these questions about human nature society relations, we have to look at that border and how that border is itself drawn. Um, but the overall point that geographers tend to make is that humans are part of nature. They're not apart from it. They're not distanced from it. I think you can really see that from this picture from Ashgabat, where this is, you know, a, a, a wonderful planted park area, and you can tell that it's planted, right, because of how systematic the rows of trees are, and there's somehow a sense that that's artificial. But are those trees artificial? What, what is artificial about that? What makes that not natural? In some ways it is natural, but in other ways it's human controlled and human managed. Uh, so this, this understanding is, is really important to understand and, and approach environmental issues, uh, that, that humans are always part of this equation. Uh, resources are another big keyword that we have to understand and have to think about uh, as a sort of social construction. Many people think, okay, oil, that's a, that's a pretty obvious resource. Uh, we understand what that is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, it, uh, that, that all societies use oil as a resource. Uh, 
historically, oil was not seen as a resource. It was seen as a problem uh, for, for many centuries until we understood how we might be able to harness and use oil. So how does it come to be seen as valuable? Uh, so that, that is one kind of question. But there, there are other things that are not necessarily uh, questioned as useful or not. We all need water and we all need food to survive. So those are kind of life essentials. There's not really a question that those are resources. Um, but the other kind of socially constructed resources are those things like oil, right? Uh, oil, gas, fuel, um, all sorts of things that you have to understand as a society that this is a useful uh, good to use and we have a purpose for that. Uh, other things like precious, uh, precious metals, uh, you, you might think of gold as one example. Gold has some social uses, but we also give it a lot more value than perhaps it might really deserve. We, we culturally estimate gold to be a significant commodity. Um, or uranium. Uranium wasn't seen as very valuable until the nuclear age, right? Uh, so these sorts of things all have to be socially understood and constructed and used as, uh, as a kind of resource, as something that you can, that you can uh, put to a social use. The third sort of framing term that I'll, that I'll introduce is uh, security. And security is another one of those terms that's, that seems really easy to, to define until you start looking at it. Uh, so what kind of security are we talking about? Whose security are we talking about? Are we talking about the security for the state, the government? Are we talking about that for humans at the broader human level? Are we talking about the security of the environment to perpetuate uh, it itself and the sort of resources within the environment? What does security actually mean? Uh, there's many different kinds of definitions of, of security. It just so happens that in the realm of geopolitics, that definition tends to be controlled by states and militaries, right? So when we are, as geographers, trying to broaden that understanding of geopolitics and broaden that to a concept like environmental geopolitics, it's to say, let's move beyond just looking at what the state and the military define as security threats and look at a much broader understanding of that. So here it really matters who is defining a particular kind of problem. Um, and geography, as I said, I'm a political geographer. Political geographers are interested in these questions of who gets what, where, when, and how. Uh, and in asking these questions, we always emphasize that it really, really matters how you define security because that then de defines particular responses to it. What is and isn't seen as a problem? Is the environment seen as a problem? A lot of the debates about climate change today are related to this bigger question of, is climate change a problem? How do we dis define that? And then from there, what do you do in response to that? And that is the question of what kinds of solutions are being proposed. If you define climate change as a security problem from the military's perspective, the military probably has a particular kind of approach to solutions, right? And that kind of approach to solutions is probably very different from the mayor of a small town on the coast of, a, you know, of a place where the shoreline is being eroded. Their solutions probably aren't going to uh, relate to the military, right? So that is why it really matters who defines uh, issues as as problems and then how they propose. Uh, a set of responses to that. So in looking at this broader question of environmental geopolitics, uh, who narrates environmental issues as, uh, as a problem and what sort of solutions do they propose? These are the broader question, uh, this is the broader question of environmental geopolitics that we're most interested in. So Let's come to the context of Central Asia and think about this in, in how environmental geopolitics is relevant to this part of the world. Uh, obviously, these questions are all really relevant even before the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, 1991. But after this moment, uh, environmental issues gained a pretty, um, pretty uh, significant relevance for the region.
And a lot of that is because the idea of the security community, of the geopolitics security community uh, during the Cold War was so disoriented after the end of the Cold War. And so the, the purpose of the security community defined by militaries and states all of a sudden falls out. In the United States, the, the thought was, okay, the problem is the Soviet Union. Well, if the, if the problem is the Soviet Union and that's gone now, then what sort of new security challenges uh, are there? So many people in the 1990s started to think about, okay, what are the alternative security threats? Where should we be directing our attention to next? This was mind you, before 9-11. So we have this 1990s uh, decade of the search for alternative security threats before the war, the global war on terror uh, is initiated. Um, and then we sort of see the, the dominance of the terrorism framework for security. So in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, then environmental issues actually rise to the top. They gain a, a pretty important uh, role in this imagination of security threats after, world, uh, after uh, 1991. And this is popularized in a number of different venues. Uh, so people like uh, Robert Kaplan, who wrote about the coming anarchy first in a 1994 article, and then he published this uh, as in book form in 2000. Many people in the sort of popular, uh, popular media outlets, think tank world, uh, they, they were talking about the environment as this new kind of threat uh, in, in the post-Cold War world. So I'm just going to put up a, a quote from uh, the 1994 Kaplan article and I'll kind of walk through what that argument was that, that was being made. So this is from his uh, 94 article. He says, it is time to understand the environment, ca all capitals, which means it's somehow more important, right? Uh, for what it is, the national security issue of the early 21st century, the political and strategic impact of surging populations, spreading disease, deforestation and soil erosion, water depletion, air pollution, and possibly rising sea levels in critical overcrowded regions like the Nile Delta and Bangladesh. Developments that will prompt mass migration and in turn incite group conflicts. You can tell already by my dramatic reading, this is supposed to be very dramatic, right? This is a, this is a good example of fear mongering. Um, and this will be the core foreign policy challenge uh, from which most others will ultimately emanate, arousing the public and uniting assorted interests left over from the Cold War. So this becomes a really dominant set of narratives after, uh, after the end of the Cold War. This idea that the environment and all of these scary things from the global south, like surging populations, disease, uh, rising sea levels, this is going to lead to this spread of threats coming into the established core. Uh, so this, this was uh, the argument that Kaplan was putting forward. This is an argument that geographers love to hate. <laughs> we are not uh, very keen on this kind of framing, not only because of the kind of racist uh, third world othering that you see that comes out in this, that it's the Nile Delta and Bangladesh, those scary overpopulated places are going to come contaminate us. There's a big uh, racial uh, othering that goes on with this narrative, but there, there are other bigger issues uh, that, that are raised in relation to this theory and this idea that Kaplan is putting forward, which is, number one, that this is empirically not upheld. So the idea that countries are going to go to war over resources and that there's going to be conflict, um, what you actually see in the data is that environmental cooperation far outweighs environmental sort of conflicts at the state-to-state -state level. Um, beyond this, what geographers have pointed to as a problem with this sort of sensational narrative is that the, this undermines the idea that protecting the environment is a good in itself. That somehow this idea that, that something must be constructed as a security threat as the reason uh, to protect the environment. 
It also then promotes this very narrow conception of security and it implicates the victims. So for example, those people from the Nile Delta or Bangladesh who are supposed to be fleeing these environmental tragedies, that somehow they are the ones who are guilty here, right? And, and they are victims of this kind of bigger structural problem with environmental uh, relations that this, this is a very narrow view of whose security we are talking about here. And the fourth uh, critique the geographers make about this, uh, about this narrative is that it gives ownership of security to the wrong community, right? Uh, the idea that the, the it sort of privileges a military perspective, that countries are going to go to war and that there's going to be a destabilizing effect uh, from environmental issues, when the very point <laughs> of these environmental issues is that a military response is inappropriate. How are you supposed to uh, deal with the effects of climate change, for example, when one of the biggest uh, consumers of oil, for example, from the United States perspective, is the US military. If the US military is the one that is supporting this kind of uh, anti-climate policy, then how is it that they are supposed to be the source of, of solving these issues? Um, so these are some of the critiques that geographers emphasize about this kind of sensational narrative about uh, about the, the environment as a threat. But that doesn't mean that, that, <laughs> that the geographers sitting in their sort of academic silos have necessarily influenced the broader uh, community on this take. Uh, so Central Asia is a really good example of where you see that narrative touching down. That in fact, when this 1990s story about conflict uh, arising from environmental resources was going to be a, a sort of flashpoint was in, in Central Asia Exactly, and so this led to a lot of anxiety after the collapse of the Soviet Union about Central Asia going to war over water in particular, uh, but other kinds of resource related conflicts. So we'll just kind of look at that story and how that has played out in, uh, in the context of Central Asia and in the context of uh, the Aral Sea disaster. So that's part two and the first of the two examples that I'll give related to, uh, to environmental geopolitics. So first of all, just to contextualize this, the main anxiety of the security community in the 1990s was about water in Central Asia. And just to, to understand that, all of a sudden you have new political boundaries being imposed on a desert landscape where water is in short supply. And that these international boundaries now didn't necessarily exist as international boundaries before. So there was, there was concern that people were going to, to fight over this. Um, but as you can see, this, this is an arid landscape. The, the yellows are all kind of desert, d variations on desert landscapes, right? Uh, so this is a, a water scarce region. So the other piece of this that sort of came to light after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, for, the, for the international community to really pay attention to at least, uh, was the desiccation of the Aral Sea. Desiccation simply means the drying up. Um, and some people may be familiar with those images of, of boats in the desert where the sea uh, once sustained a very vibrant fishing community, it is no longer. Uh, so you can see some of the, the shifting shorelines of the Aral Sea. And so this, the international community hadn't really been paying attention to what was going on there. The Soviets knew that this was a problem for a long time, uh, but the international community wasn't aware of the extent of this. And so combined with this bigger environment conflict thesis, uh, there was a lot of concern that this would turn into a bigger problem, that this would just kind of escalate very quickly because now all of a sudden you've, you've lost all of the, this water and this sea uh, in, in the region. So just some additional uh, satellite photos, if the, if the kind of visual maps were not, were not enough, just to give you a sense of the, the shoreline from 2000 even to 2016 has, has really quite rapidly depleted. So how did we get here? Um, one of the major, well, there, there's many reasons that we, that we really saw this happen, but one of the major reasons that we ended up with water in short supply in Central Asia 
is, is the Soviet policy and the Soviet approach to farming in the region, and in particular the Virgin Lands campaign of transforming Central Asia into a home of agriculture, and in particular cash crop agriculture. Things like cotton could get a lot of international currency, where the Soviets kind of struggled to get some commodities uh, on the international market that people would pay for. The international community was willing to pay for cotton. Uh, so in that sense, cotton was a really important cash crop. And so cotton is like mm, a number of sort of uh, crops that do well in deserts, it does well if it has a lot of water applied to it. Uh, and so what the Soviets did when they transformed parts of the Central Asian steppe, this desert steppe land, into, uh, into these vast agricultural fields, that also meant that they had to irrigate this and create all of these new irrigation canals in order to uh, sustain that. So the the sort of Soviet policy was to introduce, uh, introduce this new sort of agricultural scheme in the region, um, and with that, the canals. A lot of the canals at the time, and still many of them today, were unlined. So this means that the canals are just dirt. There isn't cement or anything that is preventing the water that is being directed into these canals from seeping into the ground. And so this, this is creating a major loss of that water. If you divert that water from a river uh, and you just direct it into a lot of these, these sort of sprawling irrigation canals, you lose a lot of that water. Uh, so th this became a major problem uh, in, in, in exacerbating these, uh, these issues in the region. So the rivers that were feeding the Aral Sea were being diverted for this. And we saw the sort of, uh, the, the, so the orange outline here on this map is the Aral Sea Basin. That means the water falling within that all sort of leads into or flows into the Aral Sea region. So with that, then you have these two major rivers, the Sir Darya and the Amu Darya, that are feeding the Aral Sea. So if you divert water from those, those rivers, the water is no longer getting to the Aral Sea. Uh, and this, this is what led to uh, the depletion or the desiccation of the sea. So as I mentioned before, this was kind of, this was a domestic issue during the Soviet times, more or less, right? So it was all within the Soviet Union. And so the international community was looking at this after 1991, and they saw this big uh, sort of environmental disaster with the drying up of the sea. And then looking at the imposition of all these new international boundaries, this was the reason that people started to have anxiety about uh, there being conflict over water in the region. Um, but let's kind of go back to the human level here and move away from that international security reading of this and look at some of the consequences of this at the human level. Uh, so what happens is that the sea level starts to drop um, as the, the sea is, you know, as the water isn't getting there anymore. And this leads to these really big dust storms that plagued a lot of Central Asia for, for many years. Uh, and with that, this is a salt, this was a semi-saline lake uh, or sea lake. The terminology is, it's, we refer to it in international lingo as Aral Sea, but it's really a lake. Um, so it's semi-saline. This meant that it had a lot of salt within it. And that salt was getting blown around together with the dust uh, that sweeps across the steppe. And this was spreading uh, salt over these agricultural fields. If you, if you spray a bunch of salt on your agricultural fields, this is a problem. Your crops are not growing uh, very well if, you, if they have a lot of salt on them. So this depletes then uh, agricultural production in the, in the region and hurts farmers. So the sea itself also becomes more saline because those two rivers that were feeding the sea they were carrying in fresh water from the mountains. Uh, and so the fish that once lived in that water 
start to die. They don't, they're not able to tolerate such a salty environment. So you lose a lot of those fish, and then you lose uh, the fishing industry that, that was once quite vibrant. Local villages, uh, their economies were completely crushed as a result of this because but as the, the sort of depletion started, those communities had been heavily dependent on fishing. People didn't have a livelihood anymore, and many people uh, were forced to migrate or look elsewhere for work or to shift to other uh, less profitable livelihoods. And lastly, this uh, led to some really serious health effects for people. Uh, the salt storms and the dust storms were spreading. In addition, uh, pesticides that were, you know, sort of from the, from the various agricultural fields, people were breathing this in. Uh, and this led to a lot of lung issues. And there were on, on huge number of other sort of water contamination issues in the region. So uh, there, there were really high illness rates as a result of this in, in those local communities. So the Soviets, as I said before, they knew that <laughs> this was a problem. Uh, they wanted to figure out a solution to it for some period of time. There were even plans of trying to divert some northern rivers uh, to bring them to, as you can see from where the red line is, to divert those rivers and bring them to feed the Aral Sea. Uh, planning actually continued into the 1980s, that they were still talking about doing this. Um, this was eventually abandoned uh, for, well, just the, the impracticality of it. So there was some effort, there was some thinking that, yes, this is a problem, maybe we should do something about it. Uh, but then there was 1991, and the situation changed pretty dramatically. Uh, there was this concern, as I've mentioned already, about these sort of Central Asian water wars, and uh, this led then to uh, a big influx of international attention. And a lot of that attention ended up getting directed to Aral, uh, which is a sort of perspective that I'll, I'll give uh, in, in the, the next uh, few slides here, from my own work uh, starting in 2005 in the region. So Aral was known for being sort of the home of the fishing industry and the largest town in the Aral Sea region, uh, or one of the largest towns in the Aral Sea region, and where a lot of the international uh, visitors who came to see the disaster would end up going to this community. Um, so what, they, what the international community did is they also brought with it a lot of aid money. Um, and they tried to direct that money to various efforts to improve the environmental situation. Um, but what that, le what that aid money did is it ended up just getting it into the hands of local elites who promised to fix the problems uh, but didn't necessarily do that. <laughs> Some of them may have pocketed it, they may have put it to other sort of side projects, um, but what, what resulted from this is that you have all of a sudden these new local elites who are getting international uh, support and prestige in some level, but then just reinforcing their superiority within the local communities and perpetuating the sort of structural violence, which is a, is a, is a way of describing that sort of exclusion of the poor from the decision-making processes. And so these local communities were not necessarily benefiting from that because their elites were now just more elite <laughs> and they were, they were further away uh, and, and not necessarily benefiting from these international good intentions. So that sort of comes back to this bigger question and what I use in the chapter to sort of frame the chapter around human security is to ask what, it, what about those people? What about the fisherman that I interviewed who was a fisherman back before the Aral Sea really dried up? Or the fisherman that is there still fishing today? Um, or this little girl whose mom I've known for some years and who is growing up with the Aral Sea in the background and who wants to make a living for herself? Uh, there in the community and to, to you know, live and have a sustainable, uh, healthy childhood in the region. So what about their security? How do we incorporate that uh, into these discussions? 
So the government uh, of Kazakhstan has had some efforts to kind of speak to uh, speak to their security and to try to promote some some small projects to to help develop the region. Um, by and large, what you end up seeing this is this is a the, like the one st one stoplight that they ha now have in the, in the town. Uh, but by and large, you just sort of see the, the political capital sending its billboards, its posters, advertising uh, the, the, the beauty of the new capital city and talking about the future of, of the capital city. A lot of that development from the side of the government is, just to, is, is actually just reinforcing this pattern that the future and your aspirations and your hopes lie in the capital city rather than necessarily investing in trying to help the situation at home. That said, uh, the government of Kazakhstan did introduce this project in 2007. Uh, they built a dam together with support from the World Bank, uh, the Kokoral Dam, which is here. I think I've got that uh, bigger on another slide which is essentially uh, just to save the northern Aral Sea. So the, the idea of the dam is to keep the water that is flowing from the Sirdarya River, which is just flowing into that northern section, to try to save that little piece. And so that was what the, what the project was about. The rest of <laughs> the sea? Forget it. It doesn't. It doesn't need to be saved. It's not our problem. It's it's done. That, that was more or less the the uh, the idea behind this dam. But in any case, well, here's here's a view of it from 2015. Uh, technically, it's a dike, uh, but in any case, you do see that uh, it was constructed. It was finished in 2007, and it is working and has been uh, accomplishing the stated purpose of saving the north the North Aral Sea. So you can you can also see that just again here's the um, the, the northern piece. This is only 10% of what the, the original sea was. So this this kind of begs this question. The government of Kazakhstan has said yes this was a great success and at some level, <laughs> it's worked. It's done what it was set out to do. Um, but what is a success when you're only saving 10% of the sea? Uh, so this this fisherman, as I mentioned before, he can go out and he can fish, right? Like he took me out on this boat, and we can go and we can we can see and we can be on the water, which is remarkable. We weren't able to do that 10 years before. Um, but in any case, the the livelihood that he's able to make for himself is still very meager. Um, and you can see that in 2005, when you had the Aral Sea Harbor, the, the sea used to come here. This was the harbor, the edge. It looks the same in 2015. So this is eight years after the dike was introduced. It, the, the, it has raised the water levels a little bit, but it certainly hasn't done anything to bring the sea back to, to that community uh, where, where the sea once was. And the other big issue <laughs> with this project is that the government wants to say, yes, look, we're doing all these things to bring back the sea and bring back the water, but people still don't have running water in their homes. Right? So this is a, the, the shower and the toilets where people in this, this uh, house, uh, the, this, uh, this, this belongs to this house here. Uh, so they are, they are still having all their water uh, just from one tap and they're not able to actually access water within their home. So that, that kind of provision of water infrastructure is still completely missing in these communities. And this is where that fisherman lives, in a very poor, uh, a poor sort of settlement just in the outskirts of the Aral Sea region. So there's still this bigger question of what is success when you say, yes, we've built this great dam and we're going to bring back the northern section, but what about the people that are living there? What does it mean to bring back the sea uh, for this community when you're not actually investing in that community and their livelihood? So that's sort of back to that question of the success. And as I said already, the sort of <laughs> big unspoken issue in all of this is that what about that 90% that's not being saved? What's happening there? Um, this, this is now it's sort of seasonal, this water that you see here, that's seasonal. When it dries up, you still have those massive dust storms uh, and salt storms, and you still have a lot of those same uh, issues. 
in, in the region. So it's hard to count this uh, at times as a success. Um, one of the major reasons for this, and I think this is uh, a, a logical from some <laughs> perspective uh, rationale in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, have been highly dependent on cotton. They've, they have continued to, to grow cotton, which depends on that diverted river water that Kazakhstan has kind of been able to move away from that, whereas they haven't. They don't have oil and gas and other resources that the government has chosen to invest in. And so you do still have that reliance on cotton, which is why the water from the bottom, the, the bottom river down here, the Amudarya, is, is not getting there. And I think that's also why in the Kazakhstan River, you can, you can move away from that. So you still have that, that reliance on cotton and that at some level, as I said, that kind of makes sense. The people need work, they need some sort of livelihood. But at the same time, you do still not have any investment in lining the, the, can, the canals. I think this is a picture from my trip in Turkmenistan in 2014. Uh, you still have a lot of unlined uh, canals where the water is still just seeping into the ground. And <laughs> In Ashgabat, you have massive greening projects where you have these uh, big, you know, royal looking complexes with lots of grass and sprinklers uh, that, that are giving lots of water to this. And I'm from Arizona, so I understand how this works. The sprinklers, I don't think I have a photo of this in this slideshow. But the sprinklers are also watering the sidewalk, uh, which we do a lot in Arizona as well. Just water the sidewalk. There's no grass there, whatever. Uh, it's, it's a massive, a massive waste of water. Um, but this, this is something that is very popular in, uh, in, in Turkmenistan in particular. And you also just have these broader tree planting campaigns across Turkmenistan. So these, these are just various pictures that I've taken from across Turkmenistan where the government has invested in, in planting all these trees. And in some cases, they've irrigated them. So they have like little pipes that are piping this in. But these are not native trees. These trees should not be planted here. Um, but they're still investing huge amount of water into trying to plant them. And then they die anyways. Um, or in other cases where they don't have little irrigation pipes, you've got a, a truck with, with a, a water canister that's going and, and filling these up. So in these sorts of water extravagances, these are not the same as sort of continuing to let people grow cotton. Uh, they, they have a very different sort of political dimension and political ramification that I won't go into today, uh, but they, they give you a sense that this is not just an isolated, let's just solve one issue. These are many different people who have many different interests in how the water is being used, and it's that sort of conflict between people. It's not the conflict about the environment itself, right? The desert is the desert. Why do we necessarily need to plant evergreens? Well, according to, to some people in, in Turkmenistan, there's a reason that they plant evergreens, to please the leader. Um, but that, that, so, that sort of logic is not the logic of the desert. Right? Um, so when I'd say that political geography is, is about asking who gets what, where, uh, who gets what, when, how, why, and where, um, these, these are the reasons that, that we need to always keep uh, humans in this story about in the environment. That in order to understand why we have, we, why we can even append disaster <laughs> to the, the RLC, is because of humans, is because of human decisions, and there are a lot of different actors, and it is not just about, I don't know, Khrushchev deciding we're gonna make the, we're gonna turn this, the Central Asia into the Virgin Lands campaign and divert the water. It was not one person. He, he was one person that put his name to that plan, perhaps, but there were thousands of people whose lives were affected and brought into this bigger puzzle uh, that, that we have to understand. So a, an environmental geopolitics framework, as geographers are conceptualizing it, is to say, we have to look at all of those different people and how they are relating to that bigger puzzle in order to understand uh, how, how something like the RLC becomes a disaster for some people 
For some people, it might also be an opportunity, right? So with that, I'll turn to my second case study, uh, and I'll be briefer on this one, uh, but about the nuclear legacies uh, and Semipalatinsk in, also in, uh, in Kazakhstan. So just a little bit of contextualization to get us back to the, the Cold War time. Uh, and, and many of us who didn't live through this moment have only learned about it here through, as hearsay, you know, this idea that maybe your parents had to plan and, and do some sort of nuclear raids uh, or, you know, duck under the table at school and prepare for what happens if there's a nuclear explosion. Those sorts of things are not... Um, uh, for younger generations, they're not something that we internally understand. It's, it's hard to uh, imagine what kind of fear that must be built on, that, that somehow we're living in this world that like uh, a nuclear explosion could happen at any moment, that our city could be attacked. Um, but that sense of fear really coursed through a lot of the Cold War time. And so this idea um, really originated then with the tests, the first tests uh, in, in July of 1945 in New Mexico and the US, uh, and then the first Soviet test in, Ka in the Kazakh SSR in 1949. So the tests were actually really important for understanding uh, what, what was going on with this economy of fear related to nuclear explosions. Um, so madness, why well, I had madness on the previous slide, mutually assured destruction. That's the idea that war is possible if we, well, preventing nuclear war is actually contingent on the idea that both sides could destroy each other. So with this logic, the Soviet Union launched a nuclear attack, well, the US would launch a nuclear attack, and then we'd just destroy ourselves. Uh, so that's a mutually assured destruction. So the mutually assured destruction idea was sort of a framing to say, well, if we have that, it's this balance of terror that we won't go to war because of that. So tests, as I said, gained a strategic importance within this. But there was just built on this broader perception of risks about escalation, um, that there, there was a sense that smaller conflicts could lead to a, a broader global conflict. So with the tests themselves, uh, the it's, it's easy to understand why you might conduct a nuclear test. Let's see if the device works. That, that is the logic of it, especially early on. But the logic is much more than just a techno, you know, a, a technocentric idea. The, the logic of this was, as you can see from these, these photographers in the Nevada desert, is exactly to get those people to photograph it. Right? In the US context, it was about broadcasting that to the world to say, look, we have this technology. Look, this is what we can do. And using the spectacle of that was really quite important. This is a little different in the Soviet case because you didn't have this kind of open publicity about the nuclear tests. Yes. There, there was an international awareness that the Soviets had the weapon, and it was important for the international community to be aware of that. But by and large, the testing, most of the nuclear weapons testing that they did, they did in the Semipalatinsk area uh, of, of Kazakhstan and the, the northwest part of Kazakhstan today. Many of those tests were not even advertised to locals who lived in that community, right? The people in that community were not aware of what was going on. At some level, this was similar in Nevada. There were many indigenous communities and the sort of downwinders. These are people that lived in uh, Utah and other parts of Nevada that, that were in the sort of track of, of where the fallout would go. They weren't told, but this is a different kind of secrecy that happened in, uh, in the Kazakhstan case. So this region uh, is, is where, as I said, most of the nuclear weapons, uh, t the Soviet nuclear weapons, were tested. Uh, approximately 456 tests were undertaken between uh, this 40-year period from 1949 to 1989. 
many of those were above ground until there was international um, <coughs> ban on above ground testing, then everything was happening underground, but they were <laughs> still happening into the late 80s. Uh, as I mentioned, because there was a lot of secrecy about this, there was not uh, the, the sort of politics of the spectacle that, that worked in the same way in Kazakhstan, uh, the, the, the local populations were severely exposed uh, to the fallout from these various tests, and in some cases were actually used as intentional sort of guinea pigs uh, put out at different distances from the test to see the effects of, um, of the fallout on the, the human population. So I'll just add one footnote to this, this Central Asian story, which is to say that the United States did the same thing. The United States did a number of weapons testing in uh, the Marshall Islands in particular, uh, but other parts of the Pacific Northwest where they used humans intentionally uh, for this kind of human subjects testing. And this, this was something that uh, is, is famously documented and, and reported on in, uh, in the US context. So it's easy, I think, for a lot of Western uh, and uh, American critics of what was going on in Kazakhstan to say, oh, look, they were so inhumane. Well, the United States did the same thing. So this was a period of great inhumanity. And much of it was yes, about what, what was happening to the humans, but it was also about what was happening to the environment, right? Because people lived in these communities and their water and their soil and their animals and their animals' milk was being contaminated and people were consuming this. Uh, and this led to really, truly devastating uh, effects on those local communities. So in, by 1989, as, as you saw from the last slide, the last tests were conducted in 1989. In 1989, this was around the time when there were a lot of big protests happening across uh, Eastern Europe and increasingly on sort of the, the, uh, the Western fringe of the Soviet Union where environmental issues were really front and center for these protest movements. So some of this kind of caught on in Central Asia and specifically related to the nuclear weapons testing in Semipalatinsk. Uh, so you had this big movement that referred to itself as the Nevada Semipalatinsk movement. The idea of Nevada Semipalatinsk uh, being of trying to connect those experiences across Central Asia and uh, Nevada in the Southwest. You can even see that from the idea of, a, of an indigenous person from the U.S. Southwest uniting with, with a Kazakh person in, uh, in, in this fight against the nuclear weapons testing. And so trying to bridge this, uh, bridge this nuclear experience as a way to, to push against what was happening uh, at the international level, right? And I think this kind of experience, what, what was happening with these protesters, is such a good example of what environmental geopolitics brings our attention to what the local people are saying. That this, they're, they're essentially pushing back against that international security apparatus. And that international security apparatus, which defines their homeland, their livelihoods around the Cold War and the enemy over there in this big state, you know, and it's kind of DC versus the Kremlin. They're saying, no, this is our homeland and we live here and we need to pay attention to that and we need to refuse some of this nuclear weapons testing. Uh, and and to, they, they did so quite, quite effectively and were able to get the weapons testing uh, stopped eventually. So then, we all know, again, back to this, this shift after 1991, what happened. Uh, the, the movement stayed on for some time, but a lot of the environmental protest uh, community kind of petered out after 1991 for a number of reasons. That wasn't necessarily just because of state crackdowns on protest movements, but it was also because people's lives were completely upended. Um, again, if you, if you stay at that local perspective, if you all of a sudden lose your state job and you lose your livelihood and people's lives are completely disoriented, they have a lot less time for these kinds of activist movements um, that these environmental protesters and protest communities were depending on. So that, that 
does kind of fall away, but the president of, of Kazakhstan, uh, Nursultan Nazarbayev, he saw from the beginning a really strategic importance of uh, emphasizing his government's ability to sort of move away from nuclear weapons. And he, he made a big show after 1991 of getting rid of his nuclear weapons and, and showing that he was, you know, he was really on the right side of history. And uh, you can see even from this Astana Times article, this is from 2016, uh, that he presented Obama with this painting of, of a Kazakh artist who, uh, this was for a nuclear event in, in Washington, D.C., that he gave President Obama this, this, uh, this wonderful painting of, of a local artist who had been born without arms uh, due to living in, in this region and the sort of nuclear contamination in the region. What's happening in Semipalatinsk <laughs> has not really been addressed in a meaningful way. And so the, the sort of optics of this is convenient when it is convenient. But actually investing in trying to remediate the environment or to help the people that are living in that community, other than you know just doing a tribute to their artwork, which at some level is great, but that's not a livelihood. That's not your community's livelihood. That's not your the community's sustainability. Um, a lot of those sorts of bigger questions have been avoided in, uh, in Kazakhstan. The other big elephant in this room, which is completely absent from these stories, is the fact that Kazakhstan continues to be one of the world's largest producers of uranium. And so this, this is, and I've, I've always sort of read a lot of this politics this way, one of the important reasons that, that Nazarbayev has wanted to get out in front of this issue and to say, look, I'm this big fan of disarmament. But meanwhile, I'm going to sell uranium, which is really important for these nuclear industries in other places, uh, and to not jeopardize that extraction economy in the region. And, and I'll say also with that, a lot of that uranium mining in Kazakhstan today is, is also not safe. <laughs> like the, the uranium tailings are stored in a way that that uranium dust is spreading around, just like we heard about the Aral Sea uh, contaminating the air. And it is very dangerous to, to live in some of those regions. Uh, Uskaminogorsk is, is, is one of those uh, one of those places where it is really a center of that. Um, so these sorts of unspoken issues are really important, and again bring us back to that question of who is getting what, when, how, why, and where. What about those local people who are living in that community today? What about those people who are living downwind from that? Um, the, these are much broader questions that, that are harder to answer, frankly. Yes, it's great that, that Kazakhstan got rid of a bunch of its nuclear weapons, but but, but what then? How, how else can we think about this in a way that doesn't just privilege the state and the military security questions and actually looks at those sort of human security questions and how people's lives are actually being affected by that? And so th this is the reason that I sort of frame the chapter around this question of whose security are we talking about and trying to think about environmental geopolitics in Central Asia actually as environmental geopolitics for Central Asia. That this doesn't need to be a sort of prescriptive reading of what these people should be doing with their lives and their environments. This, this should be a question for the international community to ask, how do you empower those people to live life to their fullest without our sort of definitions of security being imposed on them? Um, so with that, thank you.